record. It's recording. I think you see all of that. All right, very good. Um, so this is just a one-page little presentation, but this is very important. This particular chapter is going to be the link we're going to see in uh, chapter seven, six is going to set us up for chapter seven, of course, and chapter seven is going to be a link into a whole new different type of study because we're going to meet a man named Saul. And so that's just preparation for this little story of Stephen that comes in. And as we begin to uh, understand how important it is as we begin to make this transition. The book of Acts, what? Transition book, right? A history book of, of, uh, the of how the beginning of the church started. So in those days, so in what days is he talking about? In those days when the apostles are out there doing all of the signs and wonders in the days where the Sanhedrin is beating them for what it is that they would have in those days. That's what he's talking about in verse 1. When the number of the disciples were multiplying. So disciples is a word that is used, um, it's a word that is used in the uh, uh, Gospels, I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble. In the Gospels, 238 times the term disciples is used in the Gospels. Okay, oftentimes talking about the 12. But 238 times it is. In Acts, disciples is used 28 times to mean believers. But do you know what? After the book of Acts, the term disciples is never used again. It becomes two new things. It is either believers or saints of the church. So this is going to transition from that term of disciples over to believers and saints are now going to be the term that we see used the most. And so the number of disciples were multiplying, not just adding, but multiplying were growing. And there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So, um, Hellenists. I want to tell you a little bit about a Hellenistic Jew. One of the misinterpretations that often occurs when you get into this chapter is that people do not realize that a Hellenist is not talking about a Gentile against a Jew. Remember, I mentioned to you earlier on that we haven't seen Gentiles added to the church yet. That hasn't started at this point. This is all Jews, only Jews. At this point, for we're in chapter 6, it's still only Jews. No one else has been added. Hellenists are Jews who lived in Greece or in the diaspora outside of the land of Israel, adapted to Greek ways because that was the culture of the day. Thank you, Alexander the Great. That was the culture of the day. Yeah, we have a we have a, in here a, what is a Hellenistic Jew in your packet if you have that if you want to look at that. So they are they are Jews who uh, had Greek culture. Now, what did that mean? Well, the Greeks thought differently than the Jews did. They they were much more open about things. There was a different uh, a different way of thinking. So they're still Jews, but they have a Greek background. For example, one of the things that I always remember, I think it's so fascinating, is the Greeks, um, you know, they, they were very fond of the nude body. And so there were bathhouses all over. In fact, when you go to Israel, you can see some of the old Roman bathhouses that were still there. But there were bathhouses, and everybody was in the nude as they exercised and did all of their things. Well, if you're a Hellenistic Jew, you're, you're what? You're circumcised, right? And so in order to look more like the Greeks, they, the very common during that time was to do a surgery where they would reverse okay. the circumcision to where you looked like everyone else. And there were Jews that did that in order to follow this look of being more Greek because that was the culture to follow. So that's one that sticks in my mind, girlies. Uh, there's a lot of other things, but that one I always just think, oh my goodness. That is pretty bizarre. So when we get to uh, uh, 
when we get to this idea of Hellenists against the Hebrews, keep in mind that we're talking about Jew against Jew still at this point. And so because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So the Greek Hellenists who were part of this new group of disciples are beginning to think that the ones who are from Israel, the, the ones that the, the Hebrew widows are getting a better deal than they're getting from the daily distribution. So what, what is this daily distribution? Well, do you remember earlier on when we talked about when the new church began, what it was one of the things that they did? They sold, they sold everything. Everything that they had, and they put pooled all of their money together so that they were waiting for the arrival of Jesus Christ to come back. And so they gave out and distributed as need would have it. All right, so culturally, in Judaism, widows are also a protected group. So they would have received... Um, you know, they would have received first calling on distribution. So what's happening here in this case is that the, the Greek Jewish widows said that the Hebrew Jewish widows got better stuff than they got. And so that was upsetting the pot there as they're all trying to uh, merge together as they wait on the Lord Jesus to return. So... The twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and they said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Okay, so at this point, what is the job of the apostles? To teach the word of God, right? That's what their miracles are authenticating. They're out there teaching the word of God. And so they do not want to, and the word used is deaconize. They don't want to, if you look at the, uh, the other page in your packet that I gave you that says there were seven chosen to serve, look down below it. And I included a Strong's Concordance for de uh, diacono, which is to deaconize, which means to serve. It's where we get our term, of course, deacons or deaconesses, mm -hmm. servers, people who serve the needs. And that's where the word comes from. And so the apostles realize we cannot be having our hand in taking care of the daily needs of everything. Our job is to present the word of God. All right. Uh, so therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So what was the job of the people? The people were to look out among themselves and pick what? Seven godly men. Now, they're not appointing them. Who appoints? The apostles are going to appoint them into that position. The people are simply just putting up seven people amongst themselves. Why? Because they're the ones who know who is honest. These are, the, these are peers among us. This one has been honest. You don't want this one in there because he's always got his hand in the pot. And you, this one's good. Not so much that one. Gossiper. Woo! You, on and on and on. You go along the line. And they pick out seven godly men that they present to the apostles. And they go, from amongst us, here's seven good godly men. Now there's some interesting things about these seven that we're going to we're going to look at. So, uh, verse 4 it says, "But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word." I think that is really important for us to remember that that is that is the job that God gave to them. It's also we're going to see it's carried on later on when we get to the elders and the deacons positions. The elders are to be what? The shepherds. They take the word of God out and present it. That's why in order to be an elder, one of the qualifications is you have to be a what? Teacher. Teacher. You have to be able to teach. If you are a person who is a server and can take care of the daily needs, which are critically important to running a church, then you're a deacon or a deaconess. You take care of those needs so that those who have been appointed by God and gifted by God to teach the word of God are free to do that. When you burden a group of 
elders or apostles in our situation with the tedious job of uh, the, the daily running of something, do they have time to teach the word of God? And that is not how God ever intended it. So these seven are the supporters who come and support the, the apostles so that they can take care of this daily distribution and anything else that comes up because the apostles have been gifted by God to go out and to build and grow the church. If we ever get to a point where our elders are so burdened with running the church that they can't teach and, and, do, and um, grow the church, go to them and say, we are, we're praying for you and we, we are praying that you'll add more deacons to your group to take that so that that, uh, 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 that gifting can be used. All right, and so um, in verse 5 it says, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, this saying of appointing some, some helpers. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Now, of the seven names that they're going to give us in, um, in verse 5, Stephen is the only one that they give us some additional information to. Why? Because the next chapter is all about Stephen. So we're being introduced to Stephen. Luke wants you to know that this one, Stephen, this first one, he's special. He's full of the Holy Spirit, and he's full of faith, because we're going to talk about him in verse 8. And then there's Philip and Procurius and, and uh, Nicanor and Timian and Parmenius and then Nicholas. And Nicholas, we get to hear a little bit about, he was a proselyte from Antioch, All right? So a proselyte, anybody know what a proselyte is? Proselyte means you're a Gentile who fully converted to Judaism previous to this. There were some in the first century who did that. Um, it, it would be like, uh, have you ever heard of anybody who converts to Catholicism? Mm -hmm. So you go through the whole ritual, you go through the whole teaching, you give up all of your Protestant ways, you are now a part of the Catholic Church. That's you if you repeat that again? The proselyte. A proselyte is someone who has converted, in this case, to Judaism okay. fully and completely, which would mean that they would have gone through the rites of circumcision. They would be part of the, the sacrifice. Everything that a Jew would do, this proselyte would do. So they are a Gentile who has given themselves fully to Judaism, converted in every way and so they were called a proselyte they were born again into judaism a new person into judaism fully jew although not jew by nationality fully part of the nation of israel okay a little earlier you were talking about how it was all jews at this point. yes what were you referring to there the the hellenistic uh widows and the hebrew widows and the church at that point there, the Gentiles have not been included yet. The only one who's in there is someone who has fully converted to Judaism. He's considered a, a, chill, a child of Israel. Okay. He's not a Gentile. Okay, so this, this, also this proselyte is also included in the nation of Israel. Okay. He would not be a Gentile in this case. He okay. lost that identity when he was born again and became one of the nation of Israel. So when you say nation of Israel, are you talking about the or no, talking I'm about talking about culturally? the culturally, the, the nationality, okay. okay? So Israel was a man, Jacob. Israel was a country. Israel is a people. Israel is a nationality. It's a whole, you, you've got to be really careful how you're going to be doing it. But when they join the nation of Israel, they become part of the nation of Israel, although they were Gentile, but they fully convert and give up all of that. He would have eaten under kosher law. He would have given sacrifice. He would have done all of that. He's uh, completely converted over. So he is not considered a Gentile. Been but circumcised. He would have been circumcised, exactly, yes. And so, um, so very interesting that he's included in with this group. The other thing that's interesting to me is that if you go back and look at all seven of these names, these are Greek names. So it's really interesting because in the Bible, you know that the New Testament was written in, in Greek. And so we often get to re read the Greek names. But then we also get to learn their Hebrew names. So, for example, uh, let's see, Peter. Peter is uh, uh, Cephas. 
you know, in, in his Hebrew name, but he's Peter. We, we get to know both names in all of those. So um, in this particular case, we're only given the Greek names, which would lead me to believe, just a point of interest here, these are probably Hellenistic Jews. These are probably Jews that have come from the diaspora outside of the land of Israel and have come in. They're, they're, they're fully integrated into Jerusalem. They're Jews, but they're part of that, and they're being chosen because they can treat the, the, the Greek widows exactly the same way as the Hebrew widows. And so likely that's the case, but now that's just, that's just a point of interest on my point. I can't say that that's absolutely why. But they, these are Greek names that they're known by. So they set these people in verse 6 before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. So the apostles lay hands on them and appoint them into this job of deaconesses. In verse 7 it says, Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. This is a really important verse, ladies. Um, the word of God is spreading. The number of the disciples were multiplying. That's, that's important because God is growing the church. I mean, talk about revival. There is a massive revival going on. It is growing, multiplying, leaps and bounds. Why? Because this is the foundation God is setting up. And so it needs to grow in a way that, that to us is obviously supernatural. But here's the important one, and I have it underlined in my Bible, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Why is that important? Because we falsely are taught oftentimes that all the Jews rejected Jesus. The Jewish people rejected Jesus. And you know what? Many of them did all of them and a great many of the priests we're not talking about the tens of thousands that have now built up around in Jerusalem and and shot out we're talking about the priests we're talking about the Levites we're talking about some of the Sadducees who have heard and seen what has happened and have become believers so when you are taught that the Jews rejected Jesus, know that tens of thousands of them did not as individuals. As a nation, they did when he came the first time. The leadership, yes, they did. They, they were part of the ones crying out for his crucifixion. But there's a great many who become believers, even of the religious sect. That's a very very important to remember. All right, in verse 8, Stephen is full of faith and power and did great signs and wonders among the people. So he has the gift of faith, full of faith, power that's given to him, and he is, only, he is one of only two, Philip being the second one, of non-apostles who are talked about as having the gifts of signs and wonders. So he is, he and Philip, are given the gift of signs and wonders along with the apostles. So this is a special man that God has carved out for a special purpose. We're going to see what that is. We're going to get to see it. But, but I'm leading you up to that. I'm laying a foundation to say he's a special guy. Full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, full of power. Did signs and wonders repeatedly among the, the people. All right, verse 9. Let's see what happens when you're a good guy. Now there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen. They were Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and they came from Sicily and Asia, and they were disputing with Stephen. All right, so these are guys, synagogue of the freedmen. These would have been people who were either children of Jewish slaves or had been freed as slaves, the synagogue of the freedmen. Um, they've actually found the identification marks of some of these th that show from first century these, these name tags, these plates that were outside these synagogues, the synagogues of the freedmen. So we, we, have, fa we have factual architectural proof that these synagogues existed. Um, in, case that, in case that sounds weird to you that there would have been a synagogue like that in Jerusalem, 
Josephus tells us that in the first century, Josephus, the famous Jewish writer who writes all about the history of Jews in the first century, uh, tells us that there were over 450 synagogues in Jerusalem. 450 synagogues in Jerusalem in the first century. Man, we think we have a lot of denominations with, you know, Baptists and Presbyterians and Methodists and Lutherans and everybody else. These guys have their own way of doing things. They, 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 they meet amongst themselves. Now, a synagogue only needed 10 men to be a...